Well, this week I decided to preach a one-off sort of sermon, a, a topical sermon that is, uh, it's not completely related to our Signs and Wonders uh, series that we just finished, although it is slightly related. And it's not, of course, a part of our Genesis uh, study that we're going back to next week. This is uh, it's not really a Father's Day sermon either because it's, it's, it's definitely needed, what we're going to talk about today, by fathers, but you ladies need this too. So uh, you'll see what I mean here in just a bit. Before we go on, I need to lay, I need to lay a little bit of groundwork in order for this message to make sense. A little groundwork. So, so first of all, if we can just sort of define, roughly anyway, the word, the word dysfunction or dysfunctional. I, I looked it up this week, and here's how the dictionary, anyway, defines dysfunction. Dysfunction is deviation from the norms of social behavior in a way regarded as bad. Now, I want to create a little space here because the fact is, there may be some things in my life that you might look at and say, wow, that's super jacked up, that's super dysfunctional, and I would say, this is just normal, it's just how I roll, right? And there may be things in your life that I might describe as dysfunctional, and you might say, works for me, as long as the wheels don't come off, I'm okay. So I realize that there's some space here as we talk about dysfunction today, uh, and there's a lot of grace that I'm going to afford you, and you're going to afford me, but the fact is there are some things in your life, and there are some things in my life that you don't want to be there, and I don't want to be there, but we just allow them. We just, we just live with them, and I want to ask and answer the question today, is that a spiritual matter? Is dysfunction in your life a Jesus issue, a gospel-related issue? But some of us don't use the word dysfunction very often, so I just wanted to define it, and I'll read this one more time, and then we'll go on. Deviation from the norms of social behavior in a way that's regarded as bad. <laughs> So I was with a, an Acts 29, that's a family of church planting churches that we're a part of. There are several hundred Acts 29 churches. Again, Acts 29 is a, uh, a diverse global family of church planting churches. We're one of those, there are several hundred of them. I was with one of my buddies, A.J. Hamilton, he's a pastor in Fort Worth. Uh, he came down to the valley just to hang, he and his wife and five kids. Uh, came down to the valley to hang with us for a few days. And we were walking through the parking lot uh, in, in Walmart, or the, well, the Walmart parking lot in Los Fresnos. We were walking through the Walmart parking lot in Los Fresnos. And you know, we were stepping over like the dirty diapers that people just throw, right? D don't do that. If that's you, don't do that. I ask people and nobody, like no, everybody says, that's not me. It's somebody. Somebody's doing it. So don't, don't throw the diapers on the Walmart parking lot. But, but we, were, we were walking through the parking lot and, and we came upon this. And my buddy AJ, he's like, wow, that's jacked up. And I was like, I didn't even notice that. I bet if you're, if you're a Valley native or if, you, if you've been here for a while, like that's totally, that's totally normal. It, that doesn't phase you a bit. It's like I say, 500 bucks. What's the what's the big deal, right? Or probably 2,000 bucks. So so AJ, on that day, he opened my eyes to uh, to something culturally in the valley that I haven't put a whole lot of thought into, and that is in the valley we have a high level of tolerance f for dysfunction. Like things can be broken. And like, we're okay with that because it, like my stuff so, is broken and, and I'm okay with that because your stuff's broken too, right? So we just live, we just kind of learn to function 
in our dysfunction. Now, there's nothing wrong with uh, taping your bumper together, but might this be an example, a metaphor of how we sort of live life individually as Christians and how we maybe even sometimes uh, let things slide here at the church? Now, if I'm sitting where you are today, I'm asking this question, and I'm going to get there. How is, this, how is this a spiritual matter, Randy? Taping your bumper together isn't a spiritual... How is this a gospel-related issue? How is this a Jesus matter? I believe it is, and, and, and we'll get there. Dysfunction in the life of a young adult. Right? This is maybe more like you got, you got a wife and kids, and you're just trying to, 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 to make it happen, Right? dysfunction in, in, the, in, in the life of a young adult. Because we have, we have quite a few young adults here at River Church. Should I unplug this to get that buzz out of here? Because I really don't want to listen to that. This whole see if that'll do it. All right, the buzz is gone. I don't know if y'all could hear it, but I could. So now it's gone. Dysfunction in the life of a young adult. We have this friend, a lovely guy to death. He's a super cool guy. He got out of high school and he started working a job and working a job hard. And he's making a living. He's single. He'd make a great uh, husband. If any of you ladies are looking for a husband, he doesn't live here. He's, he lives somewhere else. But, but, but here's the deal. He goes, uh, he goes to, the, uh, to the clothing store on a regular basis rather than going to the washeteria on a regular basis. Do you know what I mean by that? Rather than going to the laundromat on a regular basis, he goes to the clothing store. I kid you not, everywhere he goes, he just leaves clothes. And, and I, think it's, I think it's his way of not washing clothes. He, he forgets his clothes, and then he buys more clothes. Every time he comes to our house for a visit, I, I'll have a t-shirt, or I'll get a pair of swimming trunks. I... I might have his boxers on right now. <laughs> My children are going to tell me later on how inappropriate that was to say. But, but he, 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 that's how he rolls. That's how he operates. We give him a lot of freedom. Like, is there anything sinful about that? No. Is that somewhat dysfunctional? Yes. Make it a little more personal. In my own life. Okay. <laughs> That's a, yeah. That's a screenshot of my laptop. That's what that is. I've been thinking lately about how I live, how I live with a high level, a high, a high tolerance rather, for dysfunction. Is that sinful? Well, no. Is this a gospel-related issue? And I'm going to tell you, yes. You see, the whole story of the Bible is maybe a story that's slightly different than what you think. The first three chapters, the first three chapters of, of Genesis, that's the first three chapters in the Bible, just like a few pages. The Bible's a lot of pages, right? Just a few pages in, in, at the beginning of the Bible is about God kicking Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. And, and because of their sin, and now because of our sin, we are initially separated from God. And unless and until Jesus saves our souls, we continue to be separated from God. But anyway, the first three pages of, of, of uh, the, the Bible is about God kicking Adam and Eve out out of the Garden of Eden. And what came with that? Just think silently to yourself. What came with that? Not only did sin come with that, but as a result, there was chaos. Uh, there, was, there was disorganization. There was, there was death. There was what? There was dysfunction. As a result of Adam and Eve being forced out of the Garden of Eden, we now, to this day, we carry a high level of dysfunction. Relationally, financially, with our dreams and our visions and our plans and our hopes, and a great deal of dysfunction. The first three pages of the Bible is about God 
kicking Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. The rest of the Bible in its entirety is about God bringing humanity back to Eden. The rest of the Bible is about God bringing all of humanity back to Eden. Rescuing and reclaiming and redeeming. Making a, t- taking us from, a, po- from a, a point of chaos to, to a point of peace and harmony. Taking us from high levels of dysfunction and disarray to, to a place of, of, of functionality. A, a, face of, a place of, of redemption and wholeness and wellness. Taking a sick bunch of people and making them whole and well. Again, that, my friends, is the story of the Bible. How did he do it? He did, he did it through Jesus Christ's work on the cross. He came to redeem us. Jesus did not just come solely to forgive your sins. He came to redeem and reclaim and make everything about you right again. To wrong every right. To heal every wound. Now you might say, you might say, that'll never happen in this world. Like, all of our dysfunctions will never, will never go away. And I would say that's true. And, and neither will sin be completely, completely stamped out in this world. But that doesn't mean that that isn't our goal. That doesn't mean that that's not where we're headed. We are headed toward seeing sin being rooted out of our lives. Will we ever be sinless and perfect? Not until heaven. I get that. But that doesn't mean we don't try. Will we ever be completely rid of our dysfunction and our chaos in this world? No. But that doesn't mean that God is not about the business of rooting that out and making us functional and, and making us a people of peace and harmony. All right. With all that being said, today we're going to look at the story of a man in the Bible who is living the same sort of way. He's living like some of us are, merely, merely just getting by in his dysfunction. His name is Gideon. A, a few years ago, we, I preached through the book of Judges and we studied him, but he's one of my favorite men in the Bible, so, so we're going we're gonna to look at him again. Let, let's read. Uh, I'll read out loud. You, you follow along silently. Judges chapter 6. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the, the, the terebinth uh, at Oprah, uh, which belonged to Joash, the Abizrite, while his son Gideon, he's the character we're looking at today, while the son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. Let's pause for just a moment. Let me tell you what's going on here. Gideon is down in a hole. He's making bread, but he's making bread in, in, down in a hole in the wine press where they actually, or where they're supposed to be making wine. And what he's doing is he's hiding from his enemies who, who have this habit of coming in and stealing all his money and taking all of his wheat and he's left another year hungry and broke. So, so Gideon is, he, he's using uh, this, this, this inappropriate space for the job he's trying to do. He's using the wrong tool for the job. He's trying to make uh, wheat, to make bread, but he's, but he's down in, in the, the basement wine press where grapes are supposed to be made into wine. He's using the wrong tool for the job. If you've ever done that, you know how frustrating that can be. He's fearful, he's hiding away, trying not to get noticed. Two beautiful things he's making a mess of, right? Bread and wine. He's probably making really, really bad bread, and he's probably making wine that's got that, that chaff in it, you know, like it just makes you, makes you, uh, makes you, your mouth dry, the, the little pieces of wheat that are supposed to blow away. He's down the wine press, wine press getting all, he's making bad wine, and he's making bad wheat, or bad bread, and he's using the wrong tools for the job, inferior equipment. I make bread from time to time. 
Anybody here make bread? Come on, nobody makes bread? Me and, me and Judah, me and Judah make bread. Cool. All right. Um, <laughs> Judah, Judah and I make bread. Okay, so I make, I make pretty, I make pretty good bread. <laughs> I make pretty good bread. I've also, this was like 20 years ago, but Truett and I, when he was a little boy, went and picked grapes and tried to make wine, and we made really, really bad, inferior wine. It, there's an art to it. There's a skill to it. You have to use the right tools. You have to be in the right place. And you have to know what you're doing. So, going on, Gideon. He's, he's using the wrong tools, making an inferior product. Verse 12, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to Gideon, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. Now, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? The, 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 he's not a man of valor. Correct. He's hiding. How ironic that he's hiding, that, that he's afraid, that he's fearful, and the angel says to him, you're a man of valor. Now think on this. Think on this. Might that be a prophetic word? If you know the story of Gideon, you know that he is. He is a man of valor. He's down in a hole. He's fearful. He's afraid. He's not living up to his potential yet. But God sees something in Gideon that Gideon doesn't even see in himself. Verse 13, And Gideon said to this angel, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us? saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But, but now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hands of Midian. You, you see that, that, that Gideon, Gideon is frustrated, he's fearful, he's lost all hope. He's functioning in his dysfunction. Verse 14, And the Lord said to Gideon, uh, turned to Gideon and said, Go in this might of yours. What might? What power? Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And Gideon said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan, my family is the weakest in, in, in Manasseh, in, in, the whole, in the whole tribe, and, and I am the least in my father's house. He says, my family, we're nothing in the tribe of Manasseh. And by the way, it, when it comes to my family, I'm nothing in my family. You're going to use me? But God saw something in Gideon because God had put that something there. And Gideon didn't even see it yet himself. Verse 16, And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. And he said to him, If now I have found favor in your eyes, then show me a sign that it is you who speak with me. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. Now we don't have time to read the rest of the story. I wish we could. We, we, we did a few years ago. But the fact is, God does precisely what he tells Gideon he will do. I will go with you. I will be your might. And you will single-handedly destroy your enemies. It comes to pass. So, how does this relate to us? I think you see Gideon, um, like some of us, everyday adult life, living in this dysfunctional manner, just okay with, with being jacked up? I thought, what might, what might his life look like? See if you can relate to some of these characteristics. I read into the text a bit here. But, but imagine, imagine Gideon has bald tires on his chariot, but he's not saved up any money, acting as though tires don't go bad when we all know that tires go bad. His computer desktop is a total mess, just like mine. His iCloud account is, is full and no longer functioning, but he doesn't want to pay that extra five bucks, so he's just doing without iCloud. 
His phone is about three updates behind. And he always feels sorry for himself because nothing ever goes his way. Gideon was okay with messed up ways. Can you relate to that? And how much of that is a spiritual matter in your own life? Bef rather than me deciding what's right, what's wrong, what's dysfunctional, today I want us to ask ourselves individually that, these sort of questions. Let me ask you this briefly. What did God, what did Jesus rather accomplish for you on the cross? Did he deal with your sin? Yes. Did he deal with your brokenness? He did. Did he, did he, did he die so that you might be saved from your dysfunction and chaos? Yes. Did he, die, did he die so that you might be healed from your sicknesses and diseases? We talked about that last week. Yes. Jesus died for all of that. Here's what I mean by that. I referenced the Garden of Eden earlier. I'll bring it up again. Think on the Garden of Eden. Where Adam, where Adam and Eve lived with God and where they would walk in the cool of the day together with God you can imagine that. The Garden of Eden, it was not chaotic. The Garden of Eden, it was not disorganized. It was not dysfunctional. It was not broken. There was no sin. Sin plunged the earth into this dreadful death spin. And you were born, on, you were born into that. You were born into this deathful, uh, dead spin sort of trajectory. But, but the work of, of Christ on the cross is, is now writing the trajectory, of, uh, the plane of our lives. Making everything right again. All of life. Not just your morality, although that's important. Not just your thought life, although that is important. Christ has come to redeem and reclaim every aspect of your life. Your finances, your schedule, your relationships, your physical health, your mental health, everything. The coming kingdom of God that, that, that's not here yet, but it's but it's sort of here and it's on its way. We're living in the kingdom of God and yet it has not yet come to full fruition as Christians, as the church. We are now in the kingdom of God, but it's, it's not quite here yet fully. The coming kingdom of God, which we now live in, it's, it's devoid of chaos. It's devoid of dysfunction. It's devoid of sin. God is in the business of rooting all of that out of, out of your life. Today and forever. Calling his children to have, here's a big theological word, he's calling his children to have dominion over this earth. Now what does that mean? That means that, 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 that Adam and Eve were initially, they, they, they were given the responsibility to have dominion over the earth, to, to, um, <clears throat> to uh, be good stewards of this, of this earth, to be good caretakers of this earth. And we tend to think when we talk about that, we tend to think of like trees and plants and clean air and all that's important. But God, is call, God was calling Adam and Eve to have dominion over, to, have, to be good caretakers of, of their children and of their resources and of their finances or whatever they called it back then. And see now that, that you are a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, what that means is that you are following the teachings of Jesus. 
Okay, so if you, if you have now submitted your life to Jesus, you are following his will, you are following his way, then God has called you to be a caretaker of your own stuff and all the stuff around you, your children and your finances and your agenda and your schedule to, to have dominion over that, to steward that well. And he calls the church to do that as well. That's why Jesus says, hey church, you are the light of the world. Everyone's going to look to you and you're going to make me look extremely good. So let's take a test together. I have a que some questions for you. The overall, t the overall question is this. Are, are you... This is the overall question. Uh-oh. Now, the overall question is, are you functioning in, in, in dysfunction? Here's question number one. Okay, I'm going to ask you three questions today. I want you to answer this. Like, really answer it. Don't just, like, write it down. But I want you to answer it in your own, the silence of your own heart. Are you using the wrong tools in life? What I mean by that is, when we think about Gideon, he, he was making a mess of wine, and he was making a mess of bread because he was okay with using the wrong tools, okay with, with using inferior materials, and God called him out of that. How, how about you? Well, how about you? Do, do you pay your bills late, like, all the time? Do you... Forget to renew your car registration? Do you, you paying late fees on your red box and, and always, always running around in life like your hair's on fire? Just, just a, a disorganized, chaotic mess. Jesus died to rescue you from your chaos. I wonder if, because many of us were, were, were born in Brownsville or have, have lived a long time in Brownsville, I wonder if we've just sort of picked, off, picked up on, uh, sort of adopted the, the culture, uh, the, the ways of our culture. And we just think this is okay. This is all God has for us and, and we'll, we'll, take, uh, we'll take the back seat, you know, we'll... We'll, we'll be okay with, with using the wrong tool for the job. I just want you to ask yourself, is this the best, is this all that God has for me? You know, go, going and, and, and going and spending uh, $100 on a meal when you know that you don't have $50 to pay your cable bill, right? Like, like cable only costs 50 bucks, right? Uh, or, or, what, or whatever, you know, is, is your life chaotic. And, and, and does Jesus have anything to do with that? As a church, as a church, I've been really convicted this week as I had that conversation a couple of weeks ago with, with AJ. I've really been convicted this week of how much do we as a church just tolerate regarding dysfunction? When, 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 when perhaps when perhaps we could be a, a light, a city on a hill, that, that, that the, the beautiful people that we live around here in Brownsville and Cameron County, they could come to River Church and they would see and they would say, Jesus must be sweet. Because Jesus, Jesus even impacts these people's paint scheme. Like, like they're serious about everything they do. They want it to, they want it to look its best. They want to... They want to <clears throat> take the resources they have as a church and, and, and make the most of it. That must be what Jesus is like. I've just been wondering, as a church, are we okay with using the wrong tools for the job? Do, do, you, do you volunteer to serve here at River Church in, in some capacity and then leave the job half done thinking, you know... That's okay. It's good enough for Brownsville. <clears throat> I 
misspelled signs or arriving late to, 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 to teach or you make a mess that you don't clean up. And I'm not, I don't have anybody specifically in mind. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. But I just wonder if we as a church, maybe we function in our dysfunction. I, I wonder if a guest were to come. Would they say, wow, Jesus is so powerful that these people are different. These people are different, not only when it comes to morality and sin, but everything about this church has been redeemed. Everything about this church has been changed and, and made new again. Everything. Their clean bathrooms. Their awesome music. Jesus must be that powerful to make such sweeping changes in a church's life like that. And in Brownsville, of all places. Second question. It's very related. Are you comfortable with your dysfunction? I can relate, man. I, can, I, I feel your pain. The sense of disorders and, and bad habits and, and hang-ups and, and, and poor health. And, and you're like, I'm just okay with that. Like, I rest in that. If you grew up in a dysfunctional setting, then, then you probably have a super high tolerance level for dysfunction. Doesn't bother you. But Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 says that Christians are to be dreamers and visionaries and people who make big impacts on this world. And of course we are. We have, a, we have an unfair advantage as Christians because we have the Holy Spirit living in us and, and gifting us supernaturally. We have an unfair advantage. We, we ought to be dreamers and visionaries and world shapers. But as long as you're living in your brokenness, as long as you're living in your dysfunction, as long as you're just trying to keep the wheels on, you're going to have little to no impact. Drinking problems and health problems and wellness issues... And some of us, we're just comfortable with our dysfunction. God is calling us out. He's calling us to health. He's calling us to wellness. He's calling us to redemption and wholeness and order where there used to be chaos. Last question I want to ask is this. Are you operating in fear all the time? That was Gideon, right? He was just scared. He's like a scared little boy. Hiding away in a hole, taking solace in the safety and the anonymity of his work. Men, some of you are like that. I love you, but some of you are like that. You, you, find, you find solace in just the anonymity, uh, the smallness of your life. And you don't want to venture out. You don't want to take a risk with relationships. You just want to hide away and do your job. God has more for you than that. Man, happy Father's Day. I, I love you. You know that. But let me ask you, do you know a word? Do you know this word? The word is, the word is mantrum. Do you know what mantrum is? Mantrum. It's, 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 um, it's like a tantrum, right? Ex except you're a, drone, uh, you're a grown dang man, so you throw a mantrum. It's, it's when you don't get your way and you act like a kid. You know what you're doing? You're operating under fear. Like Gideon, you're, you're operating under this sense that someone wants to take my stuff and I have to guard it with all that I am. God has more for you than that, man. God has more. We're, we're called to have dominion over this world, to be agents of change. God is calling us out 
out of your fear, out of your dysfunction, calling you to a new way of life. All right, so conclusion. Here's what I want to tell you. Here's a few changes that I'm making. So I'm like, I'm going first. I'm coming clean. I'm going to be, uh, I'll be, I'll be transparent. And then you go home and do your own homework. You figure out what God's calling you calling you to. First of all, practical ways that God wants to deliver me from my dysfunction. Let's go back to this ugly picture again. There's that picture again. My, my, uh, my messy desktop. Here's what, I've, here's what I've come to realize. The last three weeks, I've been doing this. I've been either work, working at home, or I mean working here, or working at home. I do a lot of both. I will sit down, and I will turn on my computer, and it's not, it's, this isn't all related to, or, or the, my, my messy desktop isn't the, the sole reason for this, but I turn on my computer, and it's slow, and I sit there for like 10 minutes cursing, not literally, but, but being angry at my computer. And I might do that two or three times a day while that little uh, thing spins, and I could, I could waste like 30 minutes. And you know what I do? The next morning I get up, and I do it again. Like, that makes sense. Like, that isn't crazy to waste 30 minutes a day watching my, my computer while it does nothing. So what I've decided is, decided is, I need to address that rather than just living in my dysfunction. So one of the things I'm going to do, Lydia and I talked about it, and one of the things I'm going to do is when I, when I leave for about a week on vacation later on this summer, I'm giving... Uh, my laptop to Daniela. Y'all know Daniela. She did our announcements today. She's now uh, working part-time on our, uh, on our staff, working on media and working on a lot of super cool things that she's an expert at. I'm going to give her my computer, and she's going to clean all this mess up, and she's going to put things in files, and she's going to get it all super organized. And then, and then, and then we're going to look at, you know what? I've got a 10-year-old computer, uh, or eight-year-old computer, uh, maybe it's time to get a new computer. You know, maybe it's time to get some. So we're gonna we're gonna get this this matter in order. I'm starting to put more bills on auto pay these days. I used to be ag against that. I, I'm for that. I, I'm I'm taking on the responsibility more and more these days of like just for instance. Fixing a plumbing problem when it comes up rather than just using the other toilet. You know what I mean? Like, fix your problem. Relationally. Relationally. I'm trying to ramp it up a bit in my own life and, and, and not avoid hard conversations. I've had some hard conversations with, like, several of you in the last week. Loving ones. I love you. You love me. But, but let, let's... Let's, uh, Pastor Nelson Searcy says, like, there's this frog on your desk every morning. And rather than just letting it sit there, knowing that you're going to have to eat it sometime in the day, eat it first thing in the morning. Deal with it. I personally am trying to deal with some of the dysfunction in my own life. <laughs> Practical ways that God, I believe, wants to deliver us as a church from our dysfunction. Cleaning the place up. <coughs> Painting the walls. <coughs> Cleaning our own mess up when we make it. Arriving early. Preparing my lesson before gospel community so that I'm ready to lead when those who, uh, are, uh, who attend arrive. There's healing. There's redemption. There is health and wholeness to be found in the gospel, in the story of Jesus. I want that for us. I want that for me. I want that for you.